Hi, welcome to GalaxyCon Live. I'm Mike, and I have uh, Kid Cadet co-hosting with me today. Uh, you saw her yesterday when we did the Invader Zim guys, and she has brought uh, Dave Batiste on the show. Uh, Kid, thank you for setting this up. Dave, thank you for being here. Um, this show is uh, is uh, about conventions, convention experiences, and uh, why we love uh, doing this stuff. So, you know, <laughs> Kid, you want to take it from here? Sure. So I should first mention that I had the opportunity to host two panels so far for Dave at two GalaxyCon uh, conventions. And Dave, you really stood out to me because you were so incredibly kind and friendly and sweet. And I just wanted to say thank you so much again for doing this because yeah. you're a busy guy. Yeah. And well, not, not at the moment, but so, you know, it's my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. So, okay, let's start from the beginning. Um, what was the first convention that you remember attending? As as a, a guest or as a spectator? Let, let's say as a fan. As a fan, it was it was comic. I was um, Comic Con International, in San Diego, and it God, it, it must have been around. 2000, I don't know, nine, tennis, maybe, maybe earlier than that. I don't know. It goes years back. I went because I went as a spectator long before I went as, uh, you know, as a guest uh, to the conventions because I always just uh, loved them so much. Was there ever like a particular guest uh, that drew you to go to a convention? No, I went, you know, I, n I never really went for that. I really went for, I, you know, I love the cosplay, I love superheroes. Um, it wasn't really a, a one particular guest that drew me in. I was always uh, kind of surprised, uh, uh, to, you know, to see people there. But I actually usually would just go, um, not expecting to see anyone in particular, just going because I love everything. I, I love the energy and I love everything that uh, that's involved at, at, at cons. So it wasn't a particular guest that drew me in. It was really kind of... Uh, just everything, uh, kind of overall, they experience uh, superhero. It was superheroes. I love superheroes. I love uh, sci-fi stuff and stuff like that. And what? Well, it's kind of more the overall experience rather than going to see someone in particular. Do you have a favorite superhero? Um, yeah, I think so. If I had probably, if if I had to narrow it down, it would be. It, <laughs> I always feel bad saying this because, like, all my favorites, my favorites were as a kid were. Or DC superheroes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I feel a sense of guilt because I'm kind of a Marvel guy now. But I think my favorite now would be, and in this, I think this uh, can be directly attributed to Christian Bale, but it would be Batman. I think I, I'm obsessed with Batman. And that, that whole Dark Knight series just obsessed me. Um, and when I was a little kid, it was Aquaman. Uh, so uh, it was, yeah, I don't know. I was the one little kid who loved Aquaman. I was was a, it the Aquaman cartoon that got you? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I grew up in front of a TV, so it was always like the cartoons. It was a Saturday morning uh, cartoons that well, I would ride the seahorse. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, mean, I showed Momoa this when I started working with him on Seek. And he's oh, wow, very cool. Yeah, I see the A, the Aquaman yeah, A. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's that like now? We have Drax and Aquaman filming a show yeah. together. Has that been so surreal for you? It's super surreal. I think, you know, even I was kind of, um, I was like posting stuff like, because I knew long before I was actually, I uh, could announce that I was going to be on the show and I was so excited and I started putting out stuff like just pictures of me and Jason side by side, like what if, what if this could happen? And for now, now that it's happening, it's kind of crazy. It's also, um, it's just really cool with him because him playing uh, Aquaman is like, for me, is like really cool. Um, but I also just like working with him because he's just a good, he's just a good dude. Like he's just good. He's a good person. He's a good human being. He's fun to hang out with. He's really interesting. And so I think the dynamic between us is, is, is going to be special. I'm so excited to see. Yeah. Um, okay. We actually had a question. Okay. You mentioned before that you cosplay. Mm -hmm. So is this true? And what do you cosplay mm -hmm. as? Um, well, I haven't in a while, but so the last time I did, and it was years back, I went to uh, San Diego Comic Con, and I was <laughs> I just, not a lot of people got it, but I was I was Batman dressed as a Star Wars fan. <laughs> and so I was just I was Batman, and then over it I had like a like a Star Wars T-shirt and a Star Wars lunchbox and a lightsaber. 
And a lot of people just like <laughs> didn't get it. <laughs> but I thought it would be funny as if Batman was actually a Star Wars fan. So that was uh, and that That's was great. great. I feel like he would be right. Yeah. Well, there was a couple guys. Like I, I had a name tag on. It said, "Hello, my name is Batman." And some guy like. He was really rude about it. He was like, yeah, like Batman will wear a name tag. And he was like all offended. I was like, yeah. uh, well, uh, I, I, I was trying to find humor in it, but yeah, I, was, I think some people did, but then some people just didn't get it at all. Batman is more Star Wars. Superman's more Star Trek. I guess. Is that what it is? <laughs> Mike, you figured it out. Yes, man. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Okay. I, another question. Um, is the Drax costume uncomfortable? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's because it's all like it's all like paint and glue, and it just it just it eats up my skin. It's, it's kind of turns my skin into hamburgers. It's just like raw, it makes it real raw. It's really abrasive. Yeah. You know, like spending day, and I also have to shave, like really shave down to get in. It just you know I start to break out after a couple of days. It just it's awful. Is it's the process to like out. get out of the costume as difficult as it is to get into the costume? It's um much more well now the first film was different it was a completely different process, but now it's much it's much more difficult to get out of it and this was so the reason why they didn't use the the process on the first film that they have uh, from everything after is because they couldn't figure out how to get it off, and they figured out that if I sat in a sauna for a while and started to melt it off, then they could come in with like chemicals and take it off and it takes it takes about forty five minutes to actually get it off but. I, I have to sit in the sauna for about 20, 25 minutes by myself to start to melt it off before they can actually start to do it. Or it's just, it's so abrasive on my skin. It's so hard to get off because it really is. It's just like, it's glue. It's it's glued to my skin. So, but I'm but, sure it's, I'm sure it's totally worth it because you look like a badass. I think it's worth it because the first film I, I did, you know, the makeup, it not only took so long, but I just didn't think it would, it looked as good because it was like layers of silicone. So it, it was almost like I had uh, like a wetsuit on because it was big sheets of, of silicone. So I think, you know, this uh, after from Guardians 2 and all the Avengers stuff, the process was so cool. It was very abrasive, but it was like uh, just little thin sheets of glue that were on me, which was great. It was great. I think it looked better, but it also meant that I had to be in better shape <laughs> because I didn't have the luxury of having this like these big sheets of silicone covering me. So I had to, you know, be uh, work a little harder to stay in shape for uh, everything after Guardians 2. Did you get to use the sauna outside of the Drax outfit? No, hell no. I didn't. The last thing I wanted to do was be in a sauna after that. Like I have, I'm traumatized by saunas. I don't even, oh, okay. go, oh, I don't want to go in a sauna. It's like a night. Oh, oh, never mind. <laughs> um, somebody just asked who would win in a fight between Drax and Batman? Drax. Yeah, Drax. Drax. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Drax does have, have see. All right, so the cool thing about Batman is he's basically, he's got gadgets and tricks, but he's, you know, super incredible athlete, but he doesn't have regenerative powers. He's not like superhuman, uh, which I think makes him more cool, which makes people, you know, be able to relate to him. I think he's got to use his cunning. He's got to use his tricks. He's got to use his, his gadgets and stuff to to actually become like a superhero, whereas Drax is, does have superhuman abilities. Good point. <laughs> okay, so let me ask, since now obviously you've had the opportunity to do quite a few conventions, what is it like for you to see people dress up like your character? It's, you know, what's weird is I don't see all that many Draxes come through. I see a lot of Gamoras. I see a lot of Nebulas. I see a whole lot of Star Lords, but I don't see that many Draxes. I see Drax every once in a while, and it's for me it's great. Because I think Drax is, for one, it's hard to pull off. Two, I, th I think you have to be somewhat confident of your body. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sense. And so I like it. It makes me it makes me feel good. I love when people come through as Drax. It's, uh, yeah, it's always, uh, you know, it's a big deal for me. Sorry for Drax to come through. Because I just don't see them that, many, that often. So well, real we quick, before we go any further, uh, Crystal just reminded me. Yeah. Uh, anybody watching, share this live stream on Facebook as a public post before 7.30, and you'll be entered to win $50 in credit on our merch store, the Galaxy Con merch store, where we've got T-shirts and jackets and keychains and Funko Pop figures and and all sorts of great stuff. Um, so to share publicly, click the share button, then, uh, then make sure it's for everybody. It's a public post, and uh, we you'll be entered to win. We'll be able to see it and 
Yeah, uh, Chris will put it in the randomizer and we'll pick a winner at 7.30. Sweet. Awesome. All right. So hey, thanks, Crystal. I, I'm looking at some comments in the room right now. You have people in this room from Portugal. We have people in this room from Kentucky. How, how does it feel to have such this worldwide phenomenon? I mean, with, with both your wrestling and yeah. with Guardians of the Galaxy, how does that feel, Dave? It feels, uh, I don't know if I could put into words. Oh. <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. I know this. I know this woman who just asked me questions. So, touch oh. my heart a little bit. Um, it feels uh, surreal. It feels. Um, it's hard for me to put into words because it's. It's a different. It's a different kind of success, when you can get on a plane and go halfway around the world and get off the plane somewhere that, maybe you don't even speak the language and they know you. And they love you, and they you know they recognize you, and they love you. Um, so it's a it's a it's a special feeling. I, I it's a it's a very humbling. It's I think you have to understand where I come from to know how how good that feels. It's, so um, you you said you were a sci fi fan, right? Sure. Oh, definitely. So were you a big Blade Runner fan? Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So how was that? You know, for me to be in two thousand forty nine. It was really cool. Yeah. So uh, that's that's awesome to like be a fan of the thing and then actually get to do it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. That yeah, was amazing. It was incredible. And too, uh, everything about just being in, involved in it, being included, in, and the way I got the part because it wasn't easy for me to get the part. I actually had to earn the, the part and earn the respect of uh, Denny Villeneuve, and that uh, alone is a, a really special accomplishment. Denny 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 is is an amazing filmmaker. He is amazing. He's incredible, and he's. He's one of the one of the most detailed. No, I have to, I change that. He is the most detailed director that I've ever worked with. Yeah. He is so precise in everything that he wants, and to be able to give him that performance that he wants is a really is a really gratifying feeling. Yeah, he's. <laughs> Um, okay, so our friend Guy Hutchinson just asked, "Do you like roller coasters, and are you excited about the Guardians of the Galaxy ride at Epcot?" Well, I'm really excited because, and also, you know, I live in Tampa, so it's like a short ride for me. So I'm going to be there a lot, and I'm like, <laughs> when is this ride going to open up already? Because I've gone out to the one in, in Disneyland a, a few times, um, but now I'm I'm really really excited about it. Really excited, and it's kind of cool because when I go. Um, I get, you know, I, I get special treatment. They, they treat me really good. They're really excited to see me. They there. better. <laughs> I don't know. It's just kind of a good feeling. And it brings out, you know, stuff like that brings out the kid in me. I, you know, it keeps me young. Awesome. We're getting a lot more people saying they loved you in Blade Runner. If I remember correctly, are you also doing Dune? I am. So yeah. that's another incredible yeah. sci-fi. And that was that, not only that, but that was another, and just like a personal as a personal um, thing for me, like Denny called me to offer the part. He called me personally to offer me the part. I didn't have to audition for this part. I didn't have to beg and plead for, for this part. So when he actually called me, because uh, we had been tracking that project for years because I wanted to be a part of Dune. I knew they were going to uh, to uh, reboot Dune, a complete reboot, and I wanted to be a part of it so bad. And I, we checked all the time, never heard anything. And then just out of nowhere, Denny called me and offered me this part of a really great character. And I almost broke down. I was like, man, it just felt, it felt so good that, you know, someone, you know, of that caliber was actually calling me and, and he wanted me to, to be a part of this huge project. That's awesome. Yeah. And in a, in a, in a previous life, I used to work in film and I had, I worked on the uh, U.S release of one of Denny's early, early films, the film Maelstrom. I don't know if you ever saw it, but if you get the chance, it was called Maelstrom and it came out in 2000. Wow. So I've been tracking Denny for 20, yeah. like, for 20 years right. and his career and just to watch him Amazing. as a filmmaker and just grow. Yeah. It was a very small, you know, low budget, you know, French Canadian film. Yeah. And, uh, and to see him working on these just massive big budget films now, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, okay, so we know that you're a collector. So, do you mind telling us about your collection of lunch boxes? Um, <laughs> it's um, well, I have. I think I have like a couple hundred now. I'm kind of running. I'm looking for like just a few more specific ones. I've pretty much collected all the ones that I, you know, was really after. But it all started. Uh, 
it started as a, a, a gift for my ex-wife. <laughs> so I wanted to buy her something cool and I bought her this um, E.T. lunchbox because it, it was her favorite film when she was young. And I, so I bought it for her and I thought it'd be, a, a, you know, for, cool for her. She got a new job and I thought it'd be cool for her to take it to work. And she wouldn't because she didn't want to damage it. So I bought her another one. And I just got, I just, they just brought back so many memories, like childhood memories. Uh, so then I wanted to go and, and find the one that I had as a child, um, which was a Fat Albert lunchbox. That's the one I like. Yeah. <laughs> it was this Fat Albert lunchbox that my mom got in a thrift store. <laughs> it was like, but it was like really, I don't know, it just brought back so many special memories. And I just started, I don't, that's where my collection started. And I started and, and kind of became obsessed with them. And, uh, and so now, yeah, I have like a couple hundred. What, what was the hardest heroes and yeah. what, what's been the hardest one to track down um i have this uh <laughs> i have this uh 1954 uh toppy the elephant lunchbox and the reason there's they're super rare and the reason is is because they were never for sale you had like in the 50s you had, actually oh, wow. you had to take in trading stamps and you had to trade like uh, like most people have no idea what trading most people of your generation <laughs> wouldn't know what trading stamps are but older older folks like myself um they had to take trading stamps and and you could tr you know turn your trading stamps in. and it was one of the things you could get was a toppy lunchbox toppy the elephant lunchbox and then someone asked what's your favorite one so i have this uh, 1967 green hornet lunchbox and which i'm is my favorite because um bruce lee is on it you know bruce oh, lee cool. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's my favorite. And someone just asked Dukes about, oh, what was it like being a guest and what we do in the shadows? That's so awesome. I recently watched this. It was, <laughs> it was, it's actually a funny story, but so I was leaving a film and my co-star, uh, who's named Kristen Shaw, uh, was staying in Toronto. And I said, why are you staying? She said, well, I'm going to stay and, and do an episode of what we do in the shadows. And I was like, get out of here. I said, Tell Taika if he can squeeze me and I'll come and I'll do it for free. I just want to, I just want to be a part of it. And so I literally got home, I think like on a Wednesday and my agent called me and he said, Hey, did you, um, did you say something to um, Taika Waititi about doing what we do in the shadows for free? And I said, yeah, yeah. Um, are they going to get me in? He said, well, yeah, they've got a spot for you, but don't tell people that you're going to do stuff. Yeah. For free. <laughs> <laughs> And he said that that's that's not how it works. And I said, well, I just want to be a part of it. And so uh, anyway, they they flew me back, and I was I was there for like a day, and I I did my part. It was great. It was Taika's. Uh, he's really a, a free, very giving, fun director. He's just, he's just a fun person, and he's a very improv improv type type of director. So if you start throwing stuff out, he loves it. Like where some directors don't like it at all. They really want you to kind of stay the script, but with Taika is like kind of, kind of throw, we just get the gist of it, kind of throw, especially with what we do in the shadows, because it's, a, you know, it's a mockumentary. Um, so he's kind of, you know, throw the script, he gives you notes, but you know, just improv all day long and he just loves it. And you can see as he's getting excited because he's a very excited director. So if you're doing something that he like that he likes, you'll just go, <laughs> get very excited, just you know, keep going, keep going. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And the episode is, I mean, it's a huge episode. There's so many like stars in it. Like you mentioned Christian Shaw too. She's incredible. Yeah, she's amazing. I love her. I'm trying to work out a rom-com with Christian. I want to do my first rom-com with Christian Shaw. I think she's amazing. I think we would just make a, a, a kind of a wacky uh, rom-com couple <laughs> duo. Uh, I think uh, so. I, I really want to make this happen with her. Well, let's put it out into the universe. Yeah. So I'm, that's what we're doing. I just put it out. I don't think I've spoken about it before. So. Cool. Dave and Kristen. Yeah, Dave and Kristen. Rom com. Meant to be. Um, so I think we have about 10 more minutes if you guys are going to enter for the $50 Galaxy Con merch. Make sure you guys share this stream publicly. Uh, we just had another question. What Batman villain would you play if you could pick a Batman villain? Oh, I play Bane. Yeah, I if oh, you know, yeah. about it. I, I <laughs> want to be Bane. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I want to be Bane. They, you know, and DC is well aware that I want to be Bane, but uh, I don't know if it'll it'll happen. But uh, I I'm not afraid to put something out there. I want to I want to be Bane. Okay, so we have the rom com, and now we have Bane. So here we go. So you yeah. said Batman is your favorite now because of Christian Bale. Oh, you said Aquaman. Yeah. So what was your favorite Marvel guy or character when you were young? Uh, yeah. when, I, when I was young. Um, when I was younger, I think it would have probably been it's a toss-up. And I've always had a thing for the Black Panther. I think Black Panther is just just cool. 
I do something just <laughs> I, but also like I'm really uh really in love with Iron Man as well. So I think it would have been the toss up between the two. Okay. But I did, you know, I was like everybody else. I've always had a thing for the Hulk. So I don't know, man. That's a, that's a hard question. Don't ask me these questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's like asking, asking me to pick my favorite movie or pick my favorite song. It's like, Oh God, how do you do yeah, that? But growing up? Like everybody's got like their one character, yeah. yeah, that one character that you like. Well, you had yeah. Aquaman. Yeah, I think, well, Aquaman, when I was a kid, for sure. When I was a younger kid, Aquaman was by far my favorite. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's like if you ask me what my favorite movie is, I, I probably, I could probably narrow it down to three or four. Right. And then like an hour from now, it would be a different three or four. It's like, you know, I think it just depends on, you know, what years of my life, what I was related to at the time. Um, you know, whether I was you know, getting car my cartoon fix or television fix or film fix. Uh, I think it, you know, it, it it directed who I was, who influenced me, who I would, you know, became kind of intrigued with. We have a question about cars. Uh, are you going to get any more low riders? Um, no, no, I have two and they're both nightmares. And yeah. I'm not. Are they? <laughs> they're, yeah, because there's always, you know, it's just with classic cars in general, but in general, but especially classic cars that require so much battery maintenance and hydraulic maintenance you know they're always there's a leak here and there something's not working right something's loose something's missing something's leaking um so i just uh yeah i think probably not i have to content with those um i have a 64 and a 68 impala and i've just recently um i recently brought them back from california to florida so i'm just gonna for right now no i don't know right now i have i have more toys that i need i'm, I'm not gonna I'm not looking for more. So my buddy Chris just asked a question, and he and I, we, we debate about this all the time, but uh, is there a difference in your eyes between a hero and a superhero? Um, well, I, you know, I don't know. I guess I have to put some thought into that. I, I don't know. Heroes, I guess heroes are. It depends on, you know, what type of heroic act they've performed. You know, I think... Um, there's people who are heroes who don't necessarily put their lives on the line. But I think if somebody puts their life on the line, risk their life for somebody else's life, then that is a super heroic act. So I don't know. I, I could probably could think about that for a few hours before I had a, a really great answer. <laughs> but I think that would be the, the, the separation. I think you can be heroic without putting your life on the line. But I think when you put your life on the line, that just, it, changes the stakes that makes sense yeah. uh a couple of people want to know if you are a comic book collector no i don't collect comic books and i don't uh i've never i was never like super into comic books when i was a kid i was more of the kid who got his superhero fix from like i said like cartoons i always had i struggled to read when i was young i also struggled to focus but i seemed to um be able to stay uh attentive to the television and to films. I think that's why I become, became so obsessed with them. Uh, I love, I love listening to people tell stories. It's hard for me to read, um, you know, stories, but it's easier for me to watch or to listen to people tell stories. Um, and that was the way I always, I always learned better that way. I'm a, a visual person. I'm a you know, hearing person, but it's hard for me to sit and focus on something like that. But I always appreciate what I loved with comic books was always the artwork. But no, okay. I, never, I never collected. I never collected comic books. Okay. Um. Somebody wanted to know if it was hard not to laugh when you're playing Drax, and what scene was the funniest to film? Um. Oh, there was a lot. It wasn't. It was so. It wasn't that it was hard for me not to laugh because I don't find myself funny. I see the ridiculousness in some of the stuff that Drax says, obviously. But what was what's hard for me to do is keep myself from laughing when I'm making someone else laugh, which is usually Zoe Saldana, because she cracks more than anybody I've ever met in my life, and it's so endearing when she does crack because she's such a giggler that it's hard it's hard not to laugh. She sucks you right into her giggly energy. Uh, but no, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't find it super hard not to crack because just because I I just don't find myself very funny. <laughs> but you did such an incredible job. Like you, you I, I don't know. You made us all fall in love with this yeah, role. You, you, yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, someone wants to know: Are you a GI Joe or a Transformer fan? Oh, I. If I had to pick between the two, it'd be Transformers all day long. Yeah. 
And um, do you think it's possible to have a solo movie or a spin-off movie just for Drax? Yeah, I actually, you know, was asked about this recently, and uh, and I said, and I, this was James Gunn's I idea, but I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. But he actually wanted to do a rated R um, film with Drax and Mantis, and the only reason was that he wanted to be rated R because he wanted it to be super violent, <laughs> like Drax the Destroyer violent. And I love that idea because I want, you know, a lot of people have seen the comedic side of Drax, but I feel like nobody's seen Drax the Destroyer and there is that character. And I just love to get the opportunity. I even, um, with the Russo brothers on, um, when they were done Infinity War and Endgame, I was begging for that opportunity just to show that side of Drax the Destroyer because Drax usually gets his ass handed to him. In every film, Drax gets his ass handed to him. So nobody's ever really seen, you know, Drax the Destroyer. And I really wanted to bring that to screen. Uh, so I thought the idea that James had was, was brilliant, but uh, Marvel just didn't seem interested. So, well, yeah. they're wrong. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you're probably going to have Marvel Marvel right now. Yeah. yeah, and I think Matt, I think Manus is such a great balance to Drax. So I just love the idea of, and I also love Palm. So I, I just love the idea of doing that. Film. Awesome. We have a couple of people asking about your pets, and I know you have some rescue dogs. So what can you tell us about your babies? They're um, uh, they're <laughs> they're rambunctious. Uh, we're putting them through training. They're you know, um, they're a little bit on the wild side, but you know, in a good way. They're they're really loving dogs. They're sweet. They're just just a handful. I mean, just energetic and playful, and that's pretty much what they do all all day. They've uh, put on like twenty pounds since they've been with me. <laughs> they, they eat very well, but they're very healthy and they're happy and content. And I, they're they're my children. I mean, how I, many? I have two. Yeah, I have two. Yeah. What what kind? They're two pipples. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we have about three minutes left to uh, finish sharing this publicly in order to win the fifty dollar. Um, it's a fifty dollar gift card, right, to this it's store. A credit. They'll get email the credit they could use. It's a promo code they can use on the website, and we'll ship the stuff to them. Perfect. Um, why was everyone, or oh, the question is, was everyone on the set emotional during Endgame? Um, well, I guess it, I mean, depending on the scene, um, but there were scenes, some scenes that were like, that were really sad. Um, also, the funeral scene was very somber and sad. And there was something, there was something, <laughs> there was something realistic about it because you knew, and it was the same feeling that I felt when I watched Endgame. It was an end of an era. I felt like a piece of, even though I was, you know, 50, I felt like a piece of my childhood just died. <laughs> I feel like it's gone. I wanted to, I wanted to never go away. I wanted to be there. I, I wanted to continue. I want, you know, where's the story go from here? The story can't end. Um, but that's what it felt like. I felt like a piece of my innocence was lost. And it took me, like, for days I processed Endgame. Like, it, <laughs> I just sat there. I sat there for about a good 30, 40 minutes with my friends and family because we got a screening for Endgame. I was uh, I was touring for Stuber. So they worked out a screening for me um, in D.C. So I invited some friends and family. And afterwards, we all sat there for about 30 or 40 minutes just to process. <laughs> and just it was like a, a sense of mourning. And there was, like, a, for, like, a few days. And I just – I. You know, there's a huge part of me that's embarrassed to say that, uh, you know, a superhero film <laughs> touched me that much or just um, invaded my soul that much. But it really did. I just felt like a, a part of my childhood was just ripped away. Um, so, what you, you know, I, I think says a lot because when you have a movie, you know, that some uh, snooty filmmakers don't claim that this is cinema. When a film inspires you and touches you like that, how can they make that claim? I think that's a shame on them. I think it was a beautiful film. I think not only did they really cover, I mean, 10 years of storytelling, but I felt like they just dug into everybody's heart hearts and really like touched us. But I think, you know, people like us will probably be more relatable than, or be able to relate to that statement more than like people who aren't into superheroes and comics. And But I think, um, I think it was a beautiful film. I think to not call that cinema is a, is a, is a shame. Strong. All right. So, so Groot or Baby Groot? 
Um, oh man. Um, I, you know, I hate to be that guy, but I'm going to say baby group. Baby group. Baby group. I cannot love baby group. Even just saying baby group, just kind of pull up your tongue in a great way. Plus, I love Drax's interaction with Baby Group. You know, because Baby Group didn't like Drax. <laughs> and and also Drax didn't like Baby Group. I think their kind of sibling rivalry was, was something something special. Does Drax get along with Teen Groot? Um, no, I don't Teen Groot doesn't like anyone. <laughs> teen Groot is your surly, nasty, grouchy, smelly teen. Who doesn't like anybody? He's too cool for school. <laughs> um, another great question that I saw was, how do you feel that uh, wrestling prepared you for the acting world? Oh, it didn't at all. <laughs> not at all. I mean, not maybe for the world, you know, but not for the performance because the performances are so different, which is why this is why I left wrestling to pursue film because I wanted to, I was so intrigued by the performance of film because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And when I realized that, when I realized it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, when I realized how bad I was at it, I wanted to be better. And I, so I left to pursue acting and, um, and still, I'm still in pursuit because I feel like, uh, I'm still learning. I'm still growing as, as an actor. Um, and I'm just a bit obsessed with it at this point. And also filmmaking in general. I just love it. Just, it's another version of storytelling to me. Um, so now I, I think it prepared me in a way that there's no grind like, like WWE grind. I mean, you are grind. You earn every dollar you make. And, um, and, and they're, you know, they're proud to make that same statement. You know, you should be there and you should work hard and you should earn it. And, and that's how you get to the top. And so I, I, I never worked so hard as I did in the WWE. Everything after the WWE, easy as far as work, as far as that that grind. Even that, so, even that Drax costume. Even that Drax costume. I was only able to tolerate that Drax, Drax costume because I worked so damn hard in the WWE. I mean, I worked hard. We grinded. We ate bad. We didn't sleep. I mean, that was, that was our life. That was my life for years. Mostly, you know, I just sleep because of Ric Flair. But, <laughs> but I, you know, it's just, oh, just a grind. It was a daily grind where you just, you were constantly go, you were just exhausted. You were keeping yourself awake with caffeine. And so when I had to sit there and stand there for hours just to have makeup, I mean, it was like a piece of cake. Did you did you travel with Rick back in the uh, in the evolution? Yeah, yeah I did. Oh, you poor, you poor son of a bitch. Oh, oh, yeah. God. yeah, it was gonna. You know, it's really a shame. It was gonna be a part of my Hall of Fame speech, but uh, I won't get the opportunity. But um, uh, you know, one day I will. They'll yeah. they'll redo it. Yeah, yeah, it, they, for sure. But I, I definitely I, I I rode down the road with Rick and Hunter for years, and I learned so much from those guys. I wouldn't have had my my career without those guys, um, especially you know, Hunter. You know, he he really made my career, and I, he, you know, he taught me. He he, he made my career. So uh, somebody's asking about your Illuminati tattoo. Yeah, what's the story on that? So, uh, yeah, and I don't want I don't want to get too political. Um, but so Illuminati, because a lot of people, you know, they associate with this like evilness, this evil empire of rich people which is not what Illuminati originally was. It was really a secret society of influential people who uh, opposed political corruption and opposed religious influence on the public. And I thought that's, that's beautiful. So the symbolism behind it is kind of the eye of the God watching over people. And I thought it was great. And I think the original significance of the Illuminati, also you have to remember that at th that time when the Illuminati supposedly existed, because, you know, there's still... I don't know if anybody's ever proved that they existed. They definitely, there's, if they're, they're not in existence now, for sure. I think some people still think they're, you know, they're, there's an evil empire of rich people, but no. But at that time when there supposedly there was Illuminati, you know, the things that they were doing, like opposing, um, you know, uh, political corruptness and religious influence, I mean, you could be executed for those things. So of course they had to be a secret society, but there were, I think there were, originally a, a, a secret society of influential people who just uh, were trying to do the right thing. So that's what it means to me. And that's why I wear it proudly on my chest and anybody who, who thinks that it's like this evil empire that I would possibly be a part of, you know, just doesn't know me at all. <laughs> 
Um, a follow up to that, somebody wanted to know if you have a favorite tattoo. Yeah, my favorite tattoo is of my dogs. It's on my thighs. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. All right, we've uh, we've got a winner, Chris Pastizzi. Oh wow, that's awesome! <laughs> Our winner, why do you know Chris? I do. He was my my best man at my wedding. <laughs> oh no, your best man is the winner randomly. Um, <laughs> Chris Pastizzi. Uh, I still will be in touch with you. Oh, well, he won! He won the fifty bucks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, that doesn't seem right. Something seems shady there. I don't know, <laughs> Crystal. You might have to pick another winner. Also, can I have another one? Are we wrapping this up? Crystal win too. No, we got some more time. Okay, cool. Because I had one question from uh, that came in from earlier that I didn't get a chance to answer. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, it was just uh, what is the most rewarding part of your career? And that's uh, now that I've asked the question, man. That's a uh, that's a big question to answer. I think the most rewarding part of my career is that my career has given me the opportunity to do a lot of good stuff. And I know that may sound hokey cheesy, but I, you know, I, I take pride in that. I've only able to do certain stuff, for certain charities or people only pay attention to me sometimes or listen to what I say is because of the career I've had. And so now I think, especially when times are, you know, the political climate we're in, like I, I'm happy to share my opinion and I think uh, everybody should be sharing their opinion now because things have gotten that bad and not to make this political conversation because I said I wouldn't do that. I promised I wouldn't do that. But I think it's important that, you know, we hear what people think now and if, uh, and also I think that people who are in the position to give sh should give. Like I, I, I have more than I could ever want in my life and I'm happy to share with, with people. I'm happy to give and I'm happy to, raise money for people who need it or animals, especially animals who are in need. So I can only do that stuff because of my career. Well, I think, I think one of the reasons people like you as much as they do, or your fans mm -hmm. is that you are very outspoken. You've, you've never been afraid to speak up, even if it's going to get you in trouble politically yeah. with work yeah. or something else. And, yeah. uh, you know, you've always been very, you know, this is something I believe in. This is something, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I care about and I'm going to stand up for this. And, uh, I think that's it. If you believe in it, it comes from the heart. It's just your honest feeling. How can it be wrong? And if there's, I mean, I'm always willing to, to, you know, have a debate or if someone can prove me wrong about something, I'm very open-minded and I will apologize and say that I was wrong. I'm always willing to learn. But if I feel something, I really believe in it, then why not say it? I mean, if you can make an argument to, for why you believe this, then, then why not? I think, I think a lot of people live in fear. Sure. You don't want to say something, right. and you you have been of the mind. I and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, what are you going to do? Fire me? Okay, well, yeah, sure. What's it going to happen? Right? You know, what am I going to get in trouble? You're going to lose a couple of fans because of this. Right. But if you think right. something's right, you just say it. Just say it. You know, if you can make an argument for why you believe this is right, then why should you not? You know, and if you can be proven wrong that you have or of the wrong opinion, then be open minded to that. And be willing to apologize. But until you're proven that you shouldn't feel a way that you really believe in, then I think absolutely you should speak up. And I think a lot of people are drawn towards honesty as well. You can tell when people, you know, kind of, but yeah. yeah. Definitely appreciate that's it. What I mean, if it comes from an honest place and you can defend it, then you, you can't go wrong. You really can't go wrong. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And like this gentleman saying right right now that you stood up for, for James Gunn. <laughs> And, you know. Well, you were with us that weekend. Yeah. In Raleigh. Yeah. When it all went down. It was horrible. It was yeah. horrible. And you you made it known how you felt. That was great. Yeah, thank you. And I, it was, you know, what was really great about that is because, um, you know, there was some speculation that, you know, it wasn't a good idea for us to go and be out in public um, because we didn't know how people were going to respond to that. And when I said, the hell with that. This is the way I feel. I'm not hiding from anybody. If somebody doesn't like what I have to say, then they're more than welcome to come and tell me. Um, but we went and we got so much love and support, especially Sean. It was, it was, it was, I mean, it was heart wrenching. And so that's, that's why I, feel, that's why I love about this community. That's why I love about conventions. There is that type of, of love and, and community. It's a sense of community. And I feel like, we're all a bunch of misfits, but when we're there together, we're not. You know. Do you have Do you have a favorite convention experience? 
before um, we wrap this up? No, I've had, I mean, no, I don't know if I could pick one because I've, I've had a lot. Um, but no, I, I you know, I, I don't know. I think that's, that's a hard question. I have to really like think back through my cons and any memorable, anything memorable that comes to mind, even just randomly. No, I mean, there's, there's, that's what I mean. There's a lot. I mean, there's people who come through and there's WWE fans who remember this moment or that moment, or there's somebody who comes through with a guardians tattoo or a Drax tattoo. And that's like a special, really rewarding feeling. But, um, so, and there's been, just been a lot of those moments. There's, you know, c kids will come through and they've drawn you something there. People have come through and they've made you something. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't know. I feel like those are really p personal moments to actually, so to pick like one of those moments would be like a struggle because <laughs> I've had a lot of those moments and I love them all. And I appreciate them all, but that's why I love Don conventions. I, I think people, they are often surprised that I, I actually want to sit and, and it's really hard sometimes because People are trying to rush you through and they just want you to sign and move. But, you know, I want to spend time with the fans because we're usually like into all the same same stuff. <laughs> so I want to sit and have a conversation with them because they're interesting to me. They're interesting. And you always take some time with the fans. I love it because I, that's what I mean. They're just, I feel like, I feel like I'm, just, I fit in, you know, which is, is, is weird, you know, probably weird to hear, but it is, it's where I feel like internally I'm very much a misfit and I'm, I just an awkward person, but I don't feel like when I'm at conventions, I feel comfortable. I feel like I fit in and I'm kind of on the same page with people and I can relate to people. So it's a very comfortable situation for me. It's not, it's not awkward at all. It's only awkward if you put a microphone in my hand. <laughs> well, I think this is the reason you're, you're getting so much love and I always see everyone just, you know, singing your praises is because you, you are so genuine and because you do take the time and like you're the reason why conventions are so special is because people like you exist oh, and like you, you make it worth it for real. Oh, thank you. No, th yeah, thank you. Seriously. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Like, it's weird for me when someone says, you know, uh, thank you for coming to Minneapolis. It's, you know, thank you for coming to South Carolina. Thank you for coming to Albuquerque. Like it's always like, it's a humbling feeling. It's like, I want to be there. Like, it's not like I, I'm there because I want to be there. So, but it is very, it's like, those like when you say thank you to me, it's like it's I don't know how to process it. I don't know how to respond to it because it is it's almost like I, I, I I'm grateful to be in this position. Thank well, you. really grateful. And, and and the fans appreciate it. And when we see it when they come out for you, it's amazing. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so. All right. So we're going to wrap this up. Um, we do have another winner. Oh, uh, Annette Cumberness Scott. Heather, you don't know Annette. Know Annette, Annette. Scott, do you? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Annette. So Annette also wins. So we have two winners tonight. That's exciting. We have two winners tonight. Heather's friend and Annette. All right. So now you all you have to do to win is become friends with Heather. Um, oh, okay. right. great. <laughs> um, Dave, this has been great. Thank you for taking the time with us yeah, tonight. Thank you. Um, we're gonna yeah, thank we're, you. We're gonna go out and then uh, we'll see you after the the thing. Uh, so stick around for a minute. And uh, is there anything you guys want to say before we we bail? Dave, any final thoughts? No, I you know I just hope this. Uh, I hope everybody's staying safe and and healthy and and I hope this passes us. This is such a weird time. I think it's new territory for all of us. We're all. I don't know, kind of reacting and just, you know, living the best life we can. I hope it passes fast and we can all. But we'll get through it. Shaking hands and hugging and taking pictures. Yeah. And I hope that happens very soon. The human spirit will overcome. All right, yeah. everybody, thank you. And uh, Dave, thank you again, kid. Yeah, thank, you. thank you again. See you, kid. Check out the GalaxyCon store online. You can find. Oh, my commercial. Go on. <laughs> items like t-shirts signed and certified Funko Pop. Okay. It's go to the Galaxy Con store at my Shopify or at yeah. dot com, and there's a whole bunch of merch that you can get. You can get signed and certified Funko Pops. We have keychains, we have pins, we have magnets, we have uh autographs we have variant covers that you can only get at the convention so make sure to go to galaxycon.myshopify.com and you can see the toys on my office back there dave <laughs> <laughs> my nico dolls
and more technical glitches. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> they can't get enough of you. Uh, 